Coming up on Backbench, Canada's drug addiction and homelessness crisis is on the ballot. How do conservatives win this issue? The left likes to lionize themselves as the compassionate side. It is not compassionate to have someone take a shit on the street. That is not a humane way to live your life. More than it affects you or I or a small business, which it does a lot, it affects the people who, who are on the street. Drugs are all around them. There's, there's hopelessness. You don't know what the people around you are capable of, whether they're, they have really serious issues, whether they're violent, whether they're gonna smile to your face and then rob you. How can Canada move from this to this? How can we become a global superpower? Canada should be, should be a superpower. We should be an energy superpower. We should be a resources superpower. And frankly, we should be a, uh, a cultural superpower as well. The world needs more Canada, and I mean the good parts. If we can achieve that, people will see and just naturally try to emulate us because they'll see that that's what wins. Yeah. Stay tuned for all of this and more coming up now on Backbench. Thank you very much, Damon Scrace, for coming on the unnamed podcast interview show that uh, we're doing at Backbench. Damon is a friend of mine. Uh, we grew up in the Comox Valley. And now Damon is running as the candidate for MLA for the BC Conservative Party for our home riding. The Conservative Party of BC has been gaining momentum in recent polls, largely at the expense of BC United. A poll conducted by Main Street Research shows the NDP in the lead, the BC Conservatives in second, BC United lagging in third, with the Greens in fourth position. BC has a long history of federal conservatives and federal liberals operating under one unified banner, going back as far as 1945 when Liberal Premier John Hart formed a Liberal Conservative Coalition government known in BC history as the Coalition. More recently, the BC Liberal Party, now renamed to BC United, acted as the provincial party for both federal Liberals and federal Conservatives. So is there really a need for the Conservative Party of BC? First off, I do think there's a big need for the Conservative Party of BC. We, uh, we haven't had real conservative-minded governance since the 2000s. That is to say, we're, they're supposedly a coalition party, that is the BC Liberals. Were, they were a coalition in name only, essentially, because they don't implement conservative policies. There's this idea that they're supposedly a, a pro-business party, but they've done very little for primary industry or small businesses. I mean, last decade, their, their biggest uh, achievement was to start this, this uh, snowball effect of housing inflation that we've been experiencing now. And, uh, you know, most people 35 and under, they can't afford a home anymore. That is the BC Liberal legacy. And that's, what, that's one of the reasons I decided to run as a conservative rather than a BC United. In my mind, it seems impossible for a Trudeau voter and a Pierre voter to unite under one banner provincially because the two are just diametrically opposed in so many different ways. The, I feel like because the Liberal Party has moved so far to the left, it's made a coalition with federal conservatives uh, not possible. Really, I, I agree with that. It's, ba it's it's basically untenable, and I would just like to um, I would like to add that supposedly a right wing party in the BC Liberals was the first government in all of North America to implement a carbon tax, which That's is right. explicitly anti conservative and is not is anti business, and it's just a cash grab. This BC Liberal carbon tax served as a model for Justin Trudeau, who in 2015 ran on imposing a similar carbon tax on provinces who didn't particularly want one. Since then, we've all felt the effects of the carbon tax, something that's woken up people and the provinces alike. It now seems like the tide has finally turned and Canada has had enough of Justin Trudeau and the policies he has put in place. Where do you see the state of Canada as a whole today? Um, what's the vibe amongst the, the electorate? Uh, what's the snapshot that we're at right now? Mm -hmm. 
So Canada is at a state of polarization that we have not seen in our history. Even during the Quebec referendum, we were not as polarized. Families, like around the dinner table, people, we have never had so much division in our country. And a lot of that is a focus on wedge social issues that these issues that don't actually affect a majority of Canadians, these ideas of we need to do more for this really small uh, section of the population. And then this is this is held up as a virtue that we we elevate a small group over over everybody else. And in in the in the process, we, we, we trample on the majority of people's rights and their freedoms and even just their freedom to say what they think in good faith and have discussions. We, 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 are, we aren't able to have discussions like we have historically. And uh, a lot of that has just been spurred on by our prime minister, who just he, he he's very expedient political operator. He, he, he goes for the closest wedge issue that he can use to demonize his opponents or anyone who disagrees with him. And he will jump on that shamelessly. He has absolutely no problem throwing anyone else under the bus to save his own skin. And this is a this is obviously a really big problem and something to be expected from someone, frankly, who you know, d isn't uh, kind of responsible for w where he's at in the world. He he's a part of a political dynasty. He's a celebrity. He's a Kardashian, and uh, and you know, he he says the the things that that make him look good, like socially. But he isn't actually doing what's in the best interest in, uh, of Canadians when Canadians are experiencing the worst economy in many decades. On the other side of things, we have not a new leader of the Conservative Party anymore. I think he's been around for two years. Mm -hmm. I think the leadership election was 2022. I forget. 2021, 2022, something like that. I would say 90% of people, including myself, view him as the leader of the next generation of this country. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also people that view Pierre as not that different than Trudeau or just another globalist or a WEF. Mm -hmm. You know, because he had John Baird, him and John, he, John Baird was a close campaign advisor of his, and John Baird also went to the WEF mm -hmm. when uh, Harper was prime minister. Yeah. Do you view Pierre as too close to Trudeau for your liking, or do you see him as uh, someone that could actually lead us away from this Trudeau era and the era of big government? I think, I think Pierre Polyev is nothing like Justin Trudeau. I'll just go out and say that, right? Like, full stop. He's not p part of a political dynasty. He comes from a middle-class background. He was managed to act be elected uh, at f a fairly young age, uh, you know, just basically on his own merit because he is well-spoken and he is willing to, like, put himself into the fire and, and meet people and have those conversations and, you know, be persuasive. Uh, he is seen, seen as something like a uh, he, he had a he had a reputation as something of a bulldog in opposition, and uh, bef before he was the leader. And uh, I think it's just because that comes from a sense of passion. Canada's summer students grant program was seconds, not going up. to directly benefit uh, my mother or my brother. Your, your 16 seconds are up. Years. Your 16 seconds are up. I'm going to ask you again Thank because you no, no, nobody nobody believes you when you say you don't know how much money your family has got from the We Group. I've managed to meet a fair number of politicians uh, over the past eight years, and he was the first person who really had that kind of it factor of leadership and that ability to make you feel like you're the only person in the room. Like he genuinely does listen, and you know he'll he'll respond to your points in specific, and he he doesn't uh, divert to talking points like a lot of people on yeah. both sides. It feels like he genuinely cares of what you're saying. Yes, I, I that's certainly my that's certainly my impression of him, and. I've met Aaron O'Toole a bunch of times as well, and as a retail politician, he's he's great. He's like Gord Johns. It's the reason they, they get elected, but uh, it's because like person to person, they where they they feel a bit in control. They're 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 great, but as soon as they get in front of a camera, as soon as there's a crowd in front of them, they they just freeze up and they just have to go to the, whatever they've been practicing. They can't speak genuinely. Or as soon as a, a hostile reporter says something negative about your policy position or mm -hmm. about your character he or something. Push back. Yeah, yeah, there's no, no pushback. Push yeah. That's something I love about Pierre is he's not afraid of legacy journalists or, or having them write a hit piece about him. No, no, I asked you, ask you a question. You, you, keep, you keep asking we ask us the the questions. Questions. We're the journalists. We're the oh, democracy. Yeah, so we ask the questions. I, I have the freedom to ask questions if I want to, and I've just answered. I've been answering your questions all, right, all week. Here's another one. So, no, no, the I, government's introducing why would a you a carbon tax, tax credit. We're, no, we're, you're not changing the subject. I know you want to change the subject. No, I want to ask the question. Because you don't want to talk about Trudeau's carbon tax. 
You I want to ask a question because no. in a democracy Sorry. we ask the questions and you answer. And I'll, I decide the answer I give. And the yes, answer you do. and the answer is this: we will ax the tax. One issue I think that could cause problems for us is if we get too far down into the weeds of these culture war uh, conversations and that scares off the Ontario, the GTA, um, you know, people that are socially liberal, but maybe aren't happy with inflation. Um, my vantage point is that Pierre has been able to walk that line, although he has moved more into the the social discussion side of stuff. Yeah. Um, if you were an advisor to Pierre, how would you recommend he navigate uh, the line of not being too much into the culture war, but not ignoring important issues that Canadians care about as well? So if I, if, if I were to advise Pierre Polyev, I would say, and you know, conservatives win when, they, when we focus on the bread and butter issues that uh, you know we're, where we excel at. You know, we want to grow the economy, we want to build things, we really, really want to build things. It's, it, Canada has become a place where it seems like you can't get anything done uh, when it comes when it comes to big infrastructure projects and thing. You know, landmark type uh, developments. Uh, this is something that has value well beyond its. Um, its immediate utility. I think it, it, it's it's a showcase of what we can do and ha and to inspire the future generation to want to do even more and do better. And that's something we really failed we failed on as a as a country for a long time. Mm -hmm. And th so, when it comes to walking the line for Pierre, I would I, I would say, don't get into the weeds with the with what they would like to dub American style politics. Uh, unfortunately. America's biggest export uh, is its culture, and for, for sometimes for good, and um, lately it's more so for bad. When, and I, I, I would I would attribute a lot of our polarization to what's going on south of the border. The left likes to scream that conservatives in Canada bring American style politics to our discourse. My perspective of it is that it's the left bringing it in. They they basically say that. Any reaction against what we're doing is American style bigotry politics, yes. right wing populism, you know, whatever buzzword they want to throw at us. Yes. No matter where you are in this country, you walk outside, you go to the downtown of your community. It's obvious that there are countless Canadians that are suffering from serious mental health problems. Mm -hmm. But as I say that, it's not just mental health problems. It is drug addiction problems. We don't know if someone has a strictly mental health issue until we get them off the drugs. Mm -hmm. So is it schizophrenia fueled by fentanyl use or crack use, or is it genuine schizophrenia and they're treating it with crack? So mm -hmm. point being, we have a big problem. In, in our hometown, Comox Valley, uh, when we grew up, you wouldn't see people smoking crack never. in the McDonald's parking lot. Never. Yeah, yeah never. The very first time I, I saw a crack pipe in the Comox Valley was a week after decriminalization came into effect and it was hidden, not very well, underneath a garbage can right in front of our public library. The narrative has been, if you are not enabling these people to continue their drug use, you are not compassionate. You don't care about the well-being of these people. If you're not for safe supply, you're not compassionate. The compassionate approach is to let them do fentanyl on the streets and, you know, if your kid's walking by, just, you know, pull your kid a little bit closer and walk by them. That's the compassionate thing. The way that we win this is we say to the voter, this is not good for your life but it's also not good for the life of those living in drug addiction. It is not compassionate to have someone take a shit on the street. That is not a humane way to live your life. You're right, they, 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 the, the left likes to lionize themselves as the compassionate side. It's not compassionate to let people live in squalor and just to kind of like shuffle by them and you know maybe hold your breath if they're smoking something and hope you don't get uh, any any after effects of it, which happens all the time. Uh, 
But more than it affects you or I or a small business, which it does a lot, it affects the people who, who are on the street. Drugs are all around them. There's, there's hopelessness. You don't know what the people around you are capable of, whether they're, they have really serious issues, whether they're violent, whether they're going to smile to your face and then rob you. And, and every time I talk about this subject, I think about someone I went to high school with and someone who I actually worked with for over a year in commercial fishing. He is a very smart guy, quirky, and you know maybe had some uh, some maybe un less than desirable buddies that he associated with. But he was a good person, by, like through and through. Like he he wasn't malicious or violent. And just about a year ago, I happened to I was driving down Cliff Avenue, and I don't know how, but I somehow recognized my friend, and he was pushing a cart, and he had the, you know long beard. Uh, unkempt hair. He was just like totally covered up. It was a really cold winter. And I pull over and I said, dude, what's going on? Like, let me buy you some food. But how, how did this happen? I was just trying to reach you not too long ago just to catch up. And he was holding a very large bag of ice to his face. And it turns out the day before, right downtown by the war warming center, in full view of what, ha what, what is, would have been hundreds of people, three guys who were also on the street, came up behind him, sucker punched him, and started beating him into the ground with steel toe boots for, over, for about 10 minutes, is what he said. And he ended up losing a bunch of teeth. Wow. That's, how, that's how bad he got beaten up. Wow. Then they picked him up when they realized he wasn't who they thought he was, and said, hey, sorry, bud, dusted him off, and went on their merry way. So what in someone in that situation what are they supposed to do? Your whole community was just watching you get your get beaten up. No one did anything. No one called the cops. What if they? What if he was alone? What if he was in a forest camp somewhere and this yeah. had happened? There's no recourse for the people who are, are on the street, who are antisocial, and who are repeat criminals, who victimize the people. You know, the people who are down and out and trying to get better. They're the ones who suffer the most from not enforcing the laws equally and fairly in our country. And this is a huge, huge problem. And it's certainly not compassionate. Okay, for our last section, Damon, you are trying to be a member of the Legislative Assembly of British Columbia. If you're successful, you will be a young conservative shaping the movement. You already are now, mm -hmm. but I'm saying in power. You'll be young in power. Uh, perhaps you are a great example of this youthful conservative energy we have coming through the country and that will manifest into elected representatives. So first of all, I really hope it works out. Thank and you. I hope you win. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but w in 50 years time when you, I guess this is a, you'll be retired by that point, but let's say 50 years. In 50 years time, on our current trajectory, where do you see the country being in 50 years if, if things don't change, really? If things don't change in, in 50 years, we will be a completely stagnant nation that we can barely recognize as Canada. We're at a fork in the road and it's kind of now or we're going to be on a really dark path, I think, and not, not to... Um, that's not where I think we're going to go. I think, you know, the pendulum is starting to move the other way. And that's certainly what I see at the doors. And that's what I see with the youth, too. And a lot of a lot of polls reflect that with young people where they, they're rejecting what has been kind of the cultural orthodoxy for a long time. But uh, if things don't change, we're just going to, you know, there's going to be real life slums in Canada, something that was previously completely beyond the scope of imagining. We should be the country that the entire world looks for or looks to and points at and says, we want to be like Canada. We should be setting a, an example for the rest of the world. And that's how our current leader styles himself, but it's completely, he completely lacks substance because things have not improved under the current government. We fixate on these really specific issues and trying to gain symbolic victories out of them rather than real victories that everyone can feel the impacts of. And uh, I, that's, what I would like, that's what I would like to happen. I think every major city in Canada, it's, and I don't think this is a stretch at all, we should look like Singapore and Dubai. We are that rich and we have that 
capacity and the industriousness and the and the you know the innovative population that that would require and what's mainly holding us back is these kind of cottage industries and activist industries and ideas that we need to actually have a managed decline basically like what the ndp are doing with certain issues like the homelessness issue we can do something and there's nothing new under the sun and we can get through this and we can create a country that our children are really proud of of uh, of being from and and we have a really proud heritage as well and a proud history and that needs to be a much larger focus and the things that unite us and not the really small, ultimately insignificant wedge issues because Canadians are tolerant. Whatever you say, left or right, we are tolerant. Well, we will tolerate a whole lot and that's how we got to this point. Do you think Canada could possibly be a superpower country, like a top five US China level country? If so, what would it take for that to happen? Canada, Canada should be should be a superpower. We should be an energy superpower. We should be a resources superpower, and frankly, we should be a uh, a cultural superpower as well. The world needs more Canada, and I mean the good parts. I don't mean we should be dictating to everyone else and basically, you know, wagging our fingers at them and saying, "Why aren't you doing this enough?" and and, and using that as as leverage uh, in international trade. I, I think it should just be evident by our by our great success and we and that's within our grasp and if we can achieve that people will see and just naturally try to emulate us because they'll see that that's what wins but uh, we like I said we get fixated on really small issues that are divisive rather than what unites us yeah yeah I agree the the way I see it happening is we just let the economy go And with the AI revolution and, you know, with the tech, if it's an exponential increase, you just have to kind of let it happen with, yes, regulatory boundaries to make sure everything's going okay with the AI, whatever, and not destroying the environment. But um, if we just let the market innovate and explode, the easiest thing for the government to do is to do nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to pull the levers on an economy and try to fix everything and, you know, order everything in the right way. If you just sat back and let the economy go and let the people like let Canadians push us forward, Mm -hmm. that's the easiest thing for the government to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's what is needed for the country to reach that level. The government's attitude can make a huge difference on investment and what we're able to accomplish. And I want to be pro Canadian, pro British Columbian, pro growth and business and doing things that we maybe don't see as possible yet but achieving them i agree and i think that's exactly the what the next uh era of leadership should look like so damon's grace thank you very much for coming on the show uh uh, i'll link damon's twitter in the description you can go follow him and hopefully he wins uh his seat as an mla it's our home riding as i said so i'll be nicely well connected to the to the mla for the home riding if he wins so let's hope uh thank you guys everyone for watching please subscribe to the youtube channel and i'll see you in the next video